last time we covered the Colt New Service Revolver in its role with the Crown. This episode will see it serve at home and abroad with the United States. Hi, I'm Othias, and this, well, this is the Colt Double Action Revolver model of 1917, caliber .45, a new service chambering and automatic pistol cartridge, a light box. Weighing in at two and one half pounds, and with an overall length of 10.8 inches, this is nearly identical to last episode's handgun, but it now chambers the 45 ACP cartridge and does so with clips two of them, three rounds each, for a total of six. Last episode, we ran down the early history of the Colt New Service Revolver, all the way up until the gun was adopted by Canada during the Boer War. And then from there, we sort of skipped forward a bit and moved on into its role serving with the British during World War I. Basically, we kept it all in the lines of the new service as it served the Crown, but that approach left out a whole bit in the middle and at the end, specifically the 1917. Uh, so how did this particular gun end up as a U.S. service pistol? Well, the Colt New Service large frame was ready in 1898, and Colt definitely wanted U.S. military contracts, but the U.S. Army was, for the moment, contented with their new Army 38s. Again, these were guns that suffer an issue with the hand pressing opposite the swing-out crane. The, the first real test of the Colt New Army would be the Spanish-American War of 1898. This rather short and decisive conflict saw a U.S. victory, and yet it inspired some doubts. First, various state volunteers meant wildly varying small arms, many of which were single-shot black powder rifles. And secondly, the most advanced U.S. rifle, the Krag, paled in comparison to the Mauser 1893. This would result in the development of the Springfield 1903 rifle we've already covered in one of our previous episodes. Now, the immediate effect of the Spanish-American War on the new army is not entirely clear. Uh, there certainly was some big anti-38 caliber pushing that had come from the moment it was adopted. Uh, instead, much of the distrust of the 38 would come from the Philippines, and this is where reality and myths start to sort of butt heads. When the U.S. entered the Philippines, the Navy worked with the majority Tagalog peoples against the Spanish. Following the capture of Manila, however, this was reversed, with the Spanish advisors helping the U.S. to subdue the Tagalogs. This started the Philippine Insurrection, or the Philippine-American War, a guerrilla conflict that many say saw the readoption of the 45 caliber cartridge, but in reality, it was likely only a stepping stone in the process. You see, the U.S. wasn't sending its best equipment to every theater of the Spanish-American War. The early Philippine engagements were fought with Springfield rifles and shortened 1873 Colt revolvers. Now, it's often said that those were made specifically for the Philippines, but look, these single-action 45 long Colt weapons were likely originally shortened for artillerymen. We know a request for this modification was issued by General Flagler in August of 1894, well before the Spanish-American War and the subsequent Philippine fighting. So yeah, more shortened 1873s were made for the Philippines, but not because they were more powerful 45 long Colts, at least not to my knowledge, but because they were available, inexpensive in inventory, and in a cartridge that we had on hand already in that theater, being sort of a secondary theater. The conflict overall was resolved in 1902 with a combination of decisive military victories and political negotiations towards Tagalog autonomy. So the native Philippine forces stopped fighting and many would join up for the new force under the U.S. direction, one meant to relieve the U.S. Army of the role of governing the islands, the Philippine Constabulary, which was to be a mix of U.S. Army and volunteer soldiers along with native peoples. Now, these forces would need guns. In letters back to the U.S. by leadership, we see the most common on hand were the Springfield Trapdoors, Colt 1873 single actions, and interestingly, Remington single-shot shotguns. 
What they wanted were modern Krag magazine rifles, double action Colt revolvers, and the Winchester 1897 repeating shotguns. But the US wasn't keen on spending a ton of cash on the Philippines, so it would take, by example, until after the adoption of the Springfield 1903 for Krags to even arrive in any real numbers. Some commercial Winchester 93s were, or commercial 97s were purchased, but they weren't getting any 38 Colts. Uh, There's no point in mixing ammunition supply with so many 1873s already in use. So they would contract with Colt in 1902 for a 45 long Colt double action revolver. And of course they reached for not this gun at all. Instead, uh, it was the Colt 1902 pattern in 45 caliber, one of the Colt 1878 double action family fitted with an extended trigger and therefore guard. I'm gonna be honest. I have not found a clear explanation for why they went with that gun over the already available new service. I mean, they had to modify it to get it to that point. It may be that the design was better known. It may be that it was cheaper. It may be that they didn't trust the swing out cylinder all that much. Probably a bit of all of the above, but regardless, the Philippine Constabulary ended up with a 45 long Colt revolver, mostly because there were plenty of surplus 1873s, which meant ammo commonality saw the adoption of another 45 long Colt revolver. Now that does not mean the cartridge did not come in handy though, because after 1902, we still see limited fighting, now with a people known as the Moros. These Muslim Philippine natives located in Mindanao and Sulu and Padawan, I'm sure I'm beating those up, are known for their fierce fighting with an emphasis on local intelligence gathering, careful planning and sudden guerrilla attack on vulnerable targets. Initially, the US Navy had given the Moro peoples a lot of leeway. They recognized the autonomy of the Sultanate of Sulu, and they made payments to the same to ensure peace and allow US troops to be on their lands. But this arrangement was never intended to last, well, not on the US side of things. And so fighting between the Philippine Constabulary and the Moros was soon underway. Particularly feared were the Germantado, a sort of crazed suicidal melee machine. These were men who had sworn a sort of death oath, shaving, praying, receiving a blessing from a priest, and donning white clothing. They often bound their bodies tightly to resist shock and blood loss, and then they went on a crazed one-way murder spree with whatever weapons they could manage, usually knives and swords, but sometimes smoothbore rifles or whatever they could get. Jur Juramentado could be made for personal uh, reasons, anti-Christian jihad, or even bought. Sometimes they did it to forgive family debts and to prevent their loved ones from entering slavery. It's a nuanced cultural practice, one that I doubt any victim of which cares to analyze the details on though. Instead, the damn devils were just plain scary to the US troops, and many men felt greatly reassured to have buckshot and 45 long colt on hand. Unfortunately, I have yet to spot the direct link between this apprehension and the final decision to reinvest in 45. Ultimately, it's more likely that the doubts for 38 poured in from many directions, and the Moros just gave it another little drop in the bucket. Brigadier General William Crozier, Chief of Ordnance and my favorite guinea pig, would authorize an ammunition test which began in October of 1903. Ten projectiles were tested, inserted rather rapidly into live animals and human cadavers. A board overseen by Captain John T. Thompson of Ordnance, uh, a Major Louis Lagarde of the Medical Department, uh, they reviewed the effectiveness of each round. They found the greatest effect from 476 Enfield Mark III, which was fired from a Colt New Service revolver, and with that, the New Service played a key role in history. The board ultimately propelled a decision that the US not adopt another handgun cartridge unless it was at least 0.45 inch in diameter. Oh man, oh man, at this point, Colt is practically unstoppable. No one else has a gun half as good at throwing 45s around. Gotta hear you, you're not until next episode. Eh, doesn't matter anyway. We know in hindsight the US government was not gonna go with another wheel gun. They were holding out for an automatic handgun. Some pointless thing that no one remembers at all. Just another bump in the road, I'm sure. But this would take until, I wanna say 1911, I can't recall. And in the meantime, the US does have a somewhat ineffective 38 caliber on hand. So some sub trials were set up to assess a stopgap revolver. And for the most part, 
It was focused on this guy from the beginning, and the Smith & Wesson Triple Lock, a gun we'll see next time, due to its kinship to this one through the war. Uh, during government review, a few problem spots were noticed on the new service. There would be a sort of transitional model, and then a few more improvements would solidify. Well, honestly, this. This is the US Revolver model of 1909 weighing in at two and one half pounds, and at 10.8 inches long, you should be used to these numbers. The only big difference? We're single loading 45 long colt into the cylinder, which does however kick all six out at once. So that's nice. So what makes this one different from an early new service? Well, the lock work was improved with a coil spring for the bolt stop, a small, pivoted fly was removed from the rebound lever, and the Colt positive lock hammer block was added. We saw that guy last time in our animation. Now all this gets us to the transitional, but a few other changes went into this final 1909. The bottom of the crane was sealed up better, the trigger guard was thickened for strength, and a cross piece was added to the grip, again to make the gun more rigid and durable. These improvements lured the US government into adopting the gun in December of 1908, which was just rounded up to get the Model 1909. Let's get a closer look. Realistically, this gun is the same as we saw last time, although it has a much more commercial-like high polish blue. I mean, you can really see it reflecting, and there's some cruddy fingerprints and some age on this one. I mean, look at that. Uh, you guys are gonna have me in the books. So, um, Overall the same. I mean, realistically, I don't need to go into the mechanism. I don't need to show you anything. It's all identical except for the chambering. Uh, but I will say, notice these walnut grips from the US military, although these look like they might have been sanded or reshaped at some point. They'd probably be a little bit prouder than that normally, but just that plain walnut, US military all the way. So uh, what else is it tell for this gun being a 1909? Well, the small clues are the fact that on the other side, we'll have some inspection marks uh, on the underside of the barrel, we'll have a very good tell, which is a, let me flip that around so you can actually read it, US property inspection mark, hey. And then if all that isn't obvious enough, what have we got on the heel, but US Army model 1909, and then this specifically is the serial number to the gun. We'll see why that's important later. You can tell that it is because it matches down in there on the crane. Those two numbers should align. It's all matched together. Uh, it's pretty dang cool, but uh, that's really it, guys. I mean, it's the same as the previous. It's just been picked up by the US government now in 45 long cold. <laughs> all right, let's just go ahead and get this guy out to May for a demonstration. I'm gonna tell you this one feels a lot lighter and if possible, even smoother. Uh, when selecting this gun, Ordnance settled on 45 Long Colt because the cartridge was already in inventory. At the same time, however, the new service and several other guns were undergoing testing in an experimental 45 caliber cartridge that would eventually not become the 45 ACP. Uh, so part of accepting the Colt was the knowledge that it could easily be converted later on. Still, they ran into an issue. The original 45 long Colt rim was just a bit too narrow. It had been designed for a ramrod ejecting gun, 
and in extreme conditions might slip past the star ejector of the new service. So a wider diameter rim uh, was adopted and produced specifically for the 1909. These were made for the military and not for commercial sales. They had to be isolated from the older revolvers, as the 1873 cylinder is narrower and so could only chamber three of the new cartridges at a time, leaving a gap between each. So you could have shot every other pull of the trigger. That would beat the 1902, however, because the rims couldn't clear its particular loading gate, so you couldn't load it at all. Well, you gotta keep that ammo straight, and luckily the old guns were on their way out. 6,000 model 1909s were initially ordered, and an uncertain number were going to the Philippines, probably most of them. Shipments of the 1909 did continue, however, 1,000 at a time until September of 1911, when it was clearly displaced by some pistol no one remembers. By then, 19,503 of these were completed, so that's a fairly big chunk for the U.S. government at that time. 1,300 more were purchased through the Navy for the U.S. Marine Corps. Still, that's a really small number compared to what we talk about in World War I numbers, but they did serve in reserve roles, deep reserve roles. Following the Great War, these were the first big Colts to be surplused. Uh, the 1909 would also be the most common pattern in Canada. The one we saw last time, that wasn't an original new service, it was the improved new service, the 1909. Uh, by the way, these guns were also ordered, as is, by the government of Cuba. Alright, that has this particular sub-variant all wrapped up, and sadly, this would be the only real burst of U.S. adoption for a pure Colt new service. Because, as I said earlier, the U.S. was going with an automatic pistol, luckily also made by Colt, so really the company wasn't too put out by the thing. Truth be told, I wouldn't even have an episode on, well, this particular gun with such a minor reserve role if not for the extreme shortages of material brought on when war were declared. That's right, and as we've seen time and again, every gun counts. The U.S. had a few banner years selling arms to the rest of the world, but eventually had to get their hands dirty directly. And with the April 1917 de declaration of war, it was time to finally order some guns domestically. And handguns were pretty high in demand, much more so than before the Great War. Lots of special rules required a sidearm other than a rifle. Artillery, uh, machine gunners, loaders, officers, mortar crew, transport, messengers, and more. Turns out, however, regular domestic contracts and arsenal production were not going to keep up. Colt could only crank out so many 1911s even with others pitching in, so the U.S. was going to have to pull a Pattern 14 rifle maneuver and take over production lines set up for the British. Recall from last episode that Colt was supplying 455 new service revolvers to the English. Well, that meant that there was a tooled up, ready to use production line that wrapped up in 1916. In a time when that and the required skill labor were very short in supply, so Colt can zip off tens of thousands of these guns but only in rimmed cartridges. That's a problem because the now standard US cartridge, the 45 ACP, was a rimless design meant for semi-auto pistols. So the Colt revolver can handle the size and power of the 45, but there's no real way to hold on to the thing. Now, of course, they could just make more 45 long Colt and reissue it wider, but that makes for a logistics nightmare, especially when those automatic pistol productions sort of catch back up and you end up with a bunch of 45 long Colt laying everywhere. So if we're going to have a second standard gun, it's got to be in 45 ACP. Let's just put this in here and yeah, that's not helping. Yeah, no, that's going to be a pretty big issue. One that Smith & Wesson would be the first to tackle uh, by cutting a shoulder for that 45 ACP rimless cartridge into the cylinder. That way it's set up on the case mouth. Hey, now let's just get this thing out. Okay, that's not going to work. As we'll see next time, that ultimately led to a solution that came again from Smith & Wesson, who developed the Half Moon Clip, which held three rounds of 45 ACP on a simple sheet steel spring, allowing not only for the ejector to work, but also sped up reloading the gun. Uh, again, more on how that happened next episode. The US government did request that Smith & Wesson allow others to access this patent for the war, and they agreed, so Colt made use of the same device, greatly easing the supply chain. 
Colt was invited to produce on October of 1917. The final contract came later and stipulated 100,000 revolvers. They were designated Colt Double Action Revolver Model of 1917 Caliber 45, which gives us this gun today. So let's take a closer look. All right, once more, same as before. It works like any of the previous large frame Colts, although you'll notice it's a very dull blued finish. I mean, this thing's brown now because this is mid to late production. They were putting on pretty thin and this has had 100 years to really age. Same walnut grips, you, you get the idea. Some of these actually, because of the poor bluing, um, would be refurbished in World War II, so you may catch these guns parkerized. Now, you may spot from the outside, like we were talking about noticing a shaved cylinder from 455. This thing looks like a shaved cylinder from 455. I mean, look at look how close that stop is. See that cylinder stop to the back wall? That's what you would see in a shaved British gun, but since this is actually supposed to be an American gun, well, that means bingo bingo, this thing is set up for 45 ACP and it's intentionally done because we don't have a whole lot of walk here. Again, it's like half a mil, so that means that this is the original stop for 45 ACP. This gun is meant to be in the cartridge it's in, so I'm gonna turn this guy around and then what I'm gonna do is reach for these guys, these are pretty special, right? We've got, ooh, dang, three rounds in, three rounds in. These are effectively end block clips, by the way. They go and stay in the gun. And we'll close that guy up. And ooh, la, la, we have loaded our gun, albeit with dummy ammunition. Now, by the way, while I'm talking about this, I wanna point out some little idiosyncrasies of this particular gun, again, um, we have like the Colt marking, we have some government inspection marks that are like, let's say here, property of the US government is again printed on the underside of our barrel. And if we look at the heel, we also have that US Army model now of 1917. And again, what a lot of people uh, believe is the serial number. And a lot of times when you transfer these things, they'll list this as a serial number. This is actually now, unlike the 1909, this is an inventory number for the US government because the actual serial number is down in here in the crane. So that's the true serial number there, not the US inventory number. That's pretty unique uh, to the 1917 uh, Colt alone. Because of the clip, Colt did not rebate the chambers at first, but within a month, the government ordered them to do so, matching Smith & Wesson, meaning that the guns could be loaded and shot without the clips, but not necessarily ejected. Still better than no shooting at all in an emergency, though. Perhaps 30,000 Colt 1917s were produced without that rebate, and will drop a 45 ACP straight through if there's no clip present. Speaking of differences, the Colt 1917 compared to the 1909 has a bolstered barrel for strength and a shorter cylinder length to accommodate the clip and a wider cylinder block at the rear when opened up to prevent play forward and back. I don't think you will need an animation to understand, so let's just go ahead and get this straight over to May. You know, the sound on this one, compared to all the other big boars we were shooting that day, just seems so different, and I can't place why. Now, as I said, 100,000 of these were ordered. That number would be reached and then exceeded, but the true total is debated. Most references point to just over 150,000. These were contracted at a price of $14 for each revolver and included a pair of clips. Production lasted from October 1917 until February of 1919. 
that runoff past the armistice was mostly to prevent the complete collapse of the American arms industry, which was geared up for massive production for a huge spring 1919 offensive that never came. As for service, well, there are some photos, but the large majority of these guns did not ship to Europe. Their first job was to displace 1911s for the front line. Even so, demands meant a portion did see combat. I didn't catch any quotes from users, and it was a substitute standard weapon from the start, so no one was giving it much thought in terms of performance review. Uh, instead, continued 1911 production and a stand down from war meant the 1917 quickly was relegated to military storage, but they didn't necessarily stay there. Post-war, a number of government agencies would find themselves in need of sidearms, thanks to increased armed robberies and other crimes during the sort of depression years. So we see Colt 1917s used by the Post Office, Justice Department, Immigration Service, Department of Labor, National Park Service, the Treasury Department, and the Internal Revenue Service. Hmm, not like those guys were in charge of anything kind of odd back then. Uh, also, many 1917s were used by the Border Patrol until being replaced in the 1930s by more new services, but this time in 38 Special. In 1932, Colt would finally assemble about 2,000 leftover 1917 frames and sell them commercially for a steep discount. Uh, these are just like the government models, but lacking government markings. Additional new services were sold to Cuba and Canada post-war, but obviously not in 45 ACP. Last time we covered uh, the continued use in World War II by Britain, but the US also refielded their guns. In November of 1940, some 96,530 still remained in inventory. These were mostly again fielded at home. Uh, their rare theater duties revolved around issuance to military police and guards at prisoner of war camps. You can find these 1917s refurbished with new barrels made at Springfield Armory and often parkerized finishes. Overall, the new service production lasted from 1898 through about 1943, and roughly 350,000 or so of these revolvers were produced in various chamberings across the entire thing, military contracts and commercial. Uh, when I talk about chamberings, by the way, there were a lot. Uh, these were pretty much in anything that you could think of as a big bore handgun, and there were even some experimentals in 22 LR, 22 Hornet, and 41 Special. I would really like to try the 22 Hornet. Now, of course, we've only covered a narrow martial history of this gun. There were plenty of civilian adaptations you can learn about in your own time. Take a look, it's in a book, Reading Revolvers. All right, let's get into how the heck this gun handled. So for that, we're gonna need May. I'm gonna need to make room for her here in the studio. Once more, we've made room for May and another revolver now. This is pretty dang similar to last time, but what I'm holding, if you can't tell at a glance from across the room, obviously, is a Colt 1909 in 45 long Colt. So well, it might be blinding them because it's so dang shiny. <laughs> Don't worry, my fingerprints are really keeping down the glare. So let me uh, hand this to you so that you can get your mitts on there before the crime. Now, <laughs> The 1909 is just another new service. There's been no changes between this and the Colt that we saw last episode. So is there anything for you to tell us really ergonomically about this piece? Which did, now this, is, this gets messy. The one we handled last time was like early commercial war manufacturer for Britain. Even though we also talked about all the way back to 1900. This predates that one. This is a 1909. It was done commercially for a government contract, but not in a rush for wartime. They made them at a reasonable pace for the US government instead of at a frantic pace. So this is what you would think of as a proper new service the way it's supposed to be. Does it stand out as any different than that early wartime cult that you saw last episode? So basically I'm knowing that this is gonna be a more polished version of it. Absolutely, it does feel more polished. It it's feels smoother, the hammer is already lighter, that's amazing. The trigger it feels even better somehow, which Go Colt for that, dang. It also looks more polished. You know, I can see if I, if I had any broccoli in my teeth left over from lunch, which is, it's a nice plus. Um, but no, really, honestly, it feels better. It feels smoother somehow, which is incredible. Um, there is the cartridge difference, and don't get me wrong, I didn't really feel that much of a difference between 455 Webley and 45 Long Colt. If I had to pick one between the two, I guess I'd probably prefer 
probably the 45 long colt just because of the american in me so that might be a little bit biased just gonna say that yeah you got a little bit of a cowboy thing going on <laughs> but to be honest there really isn't that much difference between them other than this just feels better yeah it's they're smoother more polished gun uh i think when you handle something like a 1909 you really get a feel for what the new service can be at its peak it has all the modern features that were carried over to the rest of the line and all of the old world polish. It's it's a beautiful piece. And don't get me wrong, like I maybe didn't like gush enough about it, but when I say polished, I mean polished. That's a pretty posh gun. Yeah. With a big bore. Oh yeah. A big heart. honking bore. Yeah. So how does that rack up against something like this, which is also a Colt new service, this time in 45 ACP? Made for the U.S. government during the war, under the harshest of manufacturing. How does that go? You know, um, you can honestly tell this one's been through some stuff. It doesn't feel nearly as good. It, on, it feels gritty all the way through. Don't get me wrong, you can still pull that hammer back. It's not nearly as heavy um, as as the 455 that we shot in the, in the previous episode, but... It doesn't feel as polished, and especially since coming off of the 1909, it's nowhere near as polished feeling. It doesn't feel as nearly as smooth, and honestly, it's it's unfortunate because it's not what you're expecting of Colt. It's it's a bit of a downgrade. Um, but yeah, other than that, there's really not much of a difference, I would say, that between the two, other than it just doesn't feel as good. Yeah, and it's not bad. We're not exaggerating it. Well, we are exaggerating a little bit because we're comparing it to the highly polished 1909. But to me, a 1917 in good condition feels a lot like a Webley. I mean, in good condition. Now, this one's had some wear on it, so of course it's got some drag and things like that. But I've felt some pretty good 1917s, and they come off as smooth as a good smooth Webley. The problem is you can get a step above that out of a commercial era Colt. Like these things are really smooth. Yeah, now don't get us wrong. We are having to compare these two and we are having to stretch out the difference between them a little bit, but that's only because we're comparing two exceptional revolvers. They are both fantastic, but we do have to elaborate on the differences a little bit. So what's the magic pill on the 1917? <laughs> um, I will say, it, honestly, the half moon clips were a big plus because when it came to loading, it is significantly faster. Like it really makes a huge difference. And then popping them out can be just as, it's, it, there's no real difference in speed. I would say maybe sometimes the half moon would snag every once in a while if I angled it just wrong when trying to pop it out. Yeah, to give it a double pump. Yeah, a little double pump on that, but still not too bad. But loading was just that much faster. Now, I think if I'm comparing this to a semi-auto though, eh, Okay, we'll get that in a moment, but I agree. The half moon clip is a brilliant idea. Uh, specifically the half moon. I've actually loaded full circle moon clips and I find it to be a bit of a bother because you have to get all six to align before you can drop them in. I guess you could get good at it, but there's actually a fair amount of flex in these little cartridges. Like they have centimeters of room to move in here. And I think anything more than three and it gets really hard to align them quickly as you drop them in. I would agree with that. I have experienced that as well. It's kind of bizarre. Yeah. So the other thing about having three is that they fit up against the body better than the full moon clip and they don't get bent as easily. So you could carry these flat up on your side in a pouch in a way that you couldn't with a full moon clip. And so what you do is you take this process of having to manage six smaller objects with fine dexterity in the middle of a battlefield and you turn it into handling two bulky objects with moderate dexterity in a battlefield. Now the one thing that would make probably a difference is if I had to load those into the half moon clips myself, but luckily I don't have to. No, they came loaded like this. Right, so luckily I didn't have to do that. That would be the one thing that potentially could have bring, bought a, been a downfall for them, but yeah, no, way faster than single loading anything. Yeah, I mean, even that, you'd do it in your downtime, I guess, and pinch your fingers all the heck and back, but <laughs> okay, do these get close to the reloading speed that you're gonna get out of a detachable magazine semi-automatic pistol? No, you know what? Honestly, it's still probably not going to be there in terms of speed when you think about it, just because, I, I don't know, like you have to keep that whole half moon clip like in your pockets or something. Like There's they're kind of bulky. There's two of them. They're weird shapes. 
have they, to make sure they don't get bent when at they go, all. When they go in the pouch, they don't have an orientation in the pouch that's just right, like a magazine. A mag pouch holds it rectangularly right in the right position. You can reach for it the same way every time. Yep. You have to do two operations per gun to get six shots, whereas, let's say, Colt 1911, it's one operation to get seven shots. And then they have slop to them. They're they're sort of fluid thing in a way. Like, they have a certain amount of variance in them where you have to sort of wiggle them into place. And then... Whereas uh, the mag is firm. It just goes in the same the way. The amount of them. space those will take up versus magazines, which can be flush up against each other, is drastically different. Yeah. Like, it's, it's just a whole different ballpark, I would say, between the two. So clearly inferior to a semi-automatic handgun. Yeah. In terms of loading and capacity. Would you still pick something like a wheel gun over the 1911? Why? No, <laughs> absolutely. I picked the well. No, I picked the 1911 any day of the week, guys. I mean, come on. The 1911 is a fantastic pistol, especially in World War One. It outclasses a lot of guns, and we're not going to get into it, obviously today. But if I'm having to pick between that and a revolver, uh, yes, yeah, picking between night and day, I would say. So here's the weird thing: this gun is better than a lot of what was available to a lot of countries in the war. But what was available to the U.S. was a good semi-automatic handgun, detachable box magazine, seven-round count in, you know, a rimless cartridge. They had a good handgun going into the war. So this is not going to be as good as a 1911, but it's still actually, as much as we want to maybe snub our nose at it for not being the 1911, it's doing a lot better than a lot of stuff that was current issue in many armies. I mean, would you take this over a Ruby in 32 ACP? Yeah, especially since I can't swap mags on those guys. Yeah, I know. That's true. <laughs> you, can, you get a detachable mag, but good luck to you if you can get the spare one to line up. That's a good <laughs> point. So, yeah, uh, there's a place for this sort of thing. Um, is it a little awkward? Yeah. Do I think a 38 Special could have done better? Yeah, I think a 38 Special probably would have done better. Yeah, I mean, this isn't... By the way, here's your high-polished Colt 1909. Beautiful. Did it? Does it beat the Army Special and 38 Special that we handled, though? Because that thing was ratted out on the outside, and the internals were still smooth as butter. It did prove its longevity with that one, I would say that. Yeah, I would still take the 38 Special. I don't know about you. God, it's such a hard toss-up, because that really was a beautiful Colt. Think of your reset time. Think yeah, of your I would. You're right. I would have to take the 38 special as well. It's just, you know, honestly, I wouldn't feel sad about either choice. Like if I was given a choice between the two, yeah, absolutely 38 special. But I would not be upset with either one if I were stuck with it. Now, the 1917, you do have an advantage over that uh, army special. You get these little loaders. So there is some argument there. Yeah, that's fair. Actually, if, if anything, I probably would prefer this over the 38 special simply because of how quickly I can get that thing loaded. Yep. Now, before I forget, was there any real difference shooting 45 ACP versus 45 long bolt? Not really. I, I, not a perceivable difference for me. I mean, you didn't really get to shoot them, but you could at least be on the sidelines hearing it and looking at it. For me, it didn't really feel like there was any difference in recoil. No, I actually did get to shoot it for test firing at the range before okay. the episode, and I just I noticed absolutely nothing other than an odd sort of change in sound. That what was that? That uh, was weird. Just the pitch of the ammo, like it just had the four five five Webley and the forty five Long Colt sounded so much alike, and I thought the forty five ACP just sort of stood out as its own unique sound, and that's really it. Everything else seemed pretty straightforward. Mm. All of these were loaded smokelessly, by the way, by the time of World War One, so we're not even doing like a comparison between a smokeless and a black powder round like we normally do. I mean, the 1909 was adopted by the U.S. government in 45 Long Colt, which was originally a black powder cartridge, but after it already started loaded and smokeless. So it's it was a smokeless cartridge from the start. So nothing to compare there either. They're just honestly just good big revolvers. Yeah, they really are. But um, honestly, I wouldn't be sad with either choice if I were stuck with them. Yeah, I was about to say, would you be happier with the 45 Long Colt in the war? I wouldn't mind it. I mean, honestly, I still, it's a good cartridge. The revolver itself was fantastic, but the cartridge alone is a, it's a pretty big stopper. Oh yeah, stopper. I'd confident, I'd super Confidently, confident, yeah. yeah. Like I'd have no problem with that one. I'd I pick still, it over a lot of 32s. I'd like the loaders. I love the loaders. Yeah, I do love in the In terms loaders. of all the revolver tech we've seen, in terms of loading, I think we're, it's weird because if this was the primary revolver for a country, we'd be talking about it much more heavily instead of as an afterthought compared to the 1911. But 
this beats any of the revolvers in Europe, as far as I'm concerned, about just having these clips. But we'll talk more about that some other day. All right, so anything else on this particular gun? Nothing else, really. I mean, I, I wish this one were in better condition, but this definitely did have some wear on it. So obviously it couldn't be as pristine as we wanted it to be. But, you know, being in wartime, that's as much as you could expect. It functioned and it functioned well. So we've got three Colts that we've been through and all three got a yes from May for whether or not she'd carry them in the war, which is pretty cool. All right, well, we had other Colts, but three big Colts, because we've also had the new Army and the Army Special, if you want to check those old episodes out. All right, if you want to know more about what's going on with the show, stay after the credits for updates, but otherwise, we'll see you next time. Night, guys. All right, gang, I'm gonna keep this short and sweet because you've probably been bombarded with videos thanks to our summer That's my finger. <laughs> my finger. t-shirt campaign. This, this is a limited time offer. So if you're coming to this much later, very sorry you missed out. You can always support us over on Patreon. I won't go into any more detail though because you guys can check out any of the other contemporary videos to see what's going on right now. There's been a lot of announcements in the wind. Have a good one.